I started at military college in the summer of 1973, three years at CMR in St. Jean, then two years at RMC in Kingston with a Bachelor of Civil Engineering degree, then pilot training in Moose Jaw, the F5 course in Cold Lake, and the T33 course here in North Bay. I then went to Bagotville and flew T33s uh, while I waited my uh, voodoo course in Bagotville. I then uh, took the voodoo course and went to 425 all-weather fighter squadron uh, in Bagotville and flew there from the spring of 1981 until the summer of 1984, which was when we retired the voodoo from operational service in Bagotville. I went back to Moose Jaw and instructed on the tutor for three years. Then I came here to North Bay on a staff job with the Canadian NORAD Region Fighter Group Headquarters, during which time I flew the T-33 on a part-time basis with 414 Squadron, which was still stationed here in North Bay. At the end of that tour, I went to the F-18 course and then was flying the F-18 operationally over in Germany, initially on 421 uh, Squadron and then 439 Squadron. The changes were made for reasons of commanding officers and squadron shutdowns uh, because we ended up closing our base in Germany in the summer of 93, which was when I repatriated back to Canada. I then went and instructed on the F-5 in Cold Lake for two years, at which time they retired the F-5 from operational service. I did a lot of retiring things in my career. Uh, then I came back, I actually asked to come back here to North Bay at Fighter Group Canadian Norad Region Headquarters for a second tour. And I was here uh, for the two years that Fighter Group was still here in North Bay at that time. Uh, then I requested to stay here in North Bay as the fighter liaison and training officer at 21 Radar Control Squadron, which uh, I was given that position and stayed here for another eight months before retiring from the military and starting flying for Air Canada. In the Voodoo, uh, I went to three different sort of meets or exercises. Um, one of them, uh, two of them were in Tyndall uh, Air Force Base uh, in Florida. And uh, the first one was a weapons verification uh, trip. It was called Combat Pike. Uh, that was the just what they called the deployment and, and what we did while we were there. It wasn't really a training exercise per se. What we did was we took the airplanes up with weapons on board and fired them against drones. And uh, so during that mission, I fired uh, the AIM-4 Delta twice and the Air-2A once. And uh, the AIM-4 Delta was uh, a pretty rudimentary, very old weapon. It wasn't a great weapon. But the Air-2A was a potent weapon, if nothing else. It was a 1.2 kiloton nuclear warhead. It was unguided. Once it left the airplane, it just traveled in a straight line and then exploded after a certain time of flight. And the idea was that the shockwave would lock, knock a bomber out of the sky. Might knock us out of the sky too. Nobody ever actually fired one in anger, thank goodness. But uh, that was pretty exciting. Uh, certainly the uh, Air 2A, and you can tell from the picture, there's a lot of flame coming out of that rocket. It was a big rocket, like it was a probably two, three, two and a half to three feet around. It was carried internally and the doors rotated to expose it and then it, it was launched. There were two of them, they were only launched one at a time. But the, the flame and smoke that it produced was enveloped the airplane, it seemed, you know, and, uh, um, and I was able to watch it for quite a long time because it left a real smoke trail and it was really impressive. <laughs> uh, another exercise that uh, we went, that we had um, during my time on the Voodoo was uh, again down in Florida and it was called the Copper Flag, and it was an electronic warfare training exercise, and it attracted squadrons and support from all over Canada and the United States. It was a really big exercise, and it, you know, it included 414 Squadron from here in North Bay with all the electronic warfare stuff that they could throw at us, and uh, that was a lot of fun, because it was a real challenge, for, especially for the backseaters, you know, with the operating the radar and overcoming the electronic countermeasures that you know were being thrown out. Um, but we had pretty good success considering how old the Voodoo was at that time, because that was back in December of 1983. And I did go to Maple Flag. 
uh, as well in May of 1983 uh, out in Cold Lake. And uh, again, that was a lot of fun. One of the um, neatest things about that was that we got to see and fly with and against a whole bunch of different airplane types that we normally didn't. Most of our training in Bagotville was, you know, with just with other Voodoo's or with the T-33's from base flight, maybe with 414 Squadron. Although there was stuff going on out of Goose Bay at that time that was pretty exciting. Sometimes we'd get involved in intercepting Vulcan bombers from the RAF or B-52's from the Americans and uh, or Buccaneers as well. But the Maple Flag was really a lot of fun. I mean, we were we were there, but we were sort of uh, poor cousins, you know, because the, F, the, the F-15s in the States and, you know, all the better airplanes that they had were, you know, the ones who were kicking butt. <laughs> but we, uh, you know, we got out there and we mixed it up with them and, and uh, learned a lot and, and had a lot of fun. So those are really the three major exercises that I participated in while I was flying the Voodoo. Uh, early in my time, fairly early in my time in the Voodoo, I had an accident. Uh, it was in February of 1982. So I guess I'd been with the squadron for close to a year. And um, we had just done a training mission. It was snowing. It was about a mile of visibility. There was no horizon. And the, the snow was accumulating quickly. So the runway was covered in snow. But airplanes were taking off pretty regularly and landing. So they'd blown a, 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 you know, a narrow section of the runway clear. And when I picked up the runway, just the, the whole uh, view that I had of it caused me to descend below the glide slope and I touched down short of the runway by uh, almost 500 feet. Uh, but it, was, it wasn't a big deal initially because the wheels just kind of touched the snow that had accumulated over the winter. But then uh, about 100 feet further on, uh, I broke out into where it had been plowed short of the runway. Now, when we were flying the Voodoo, it had a really high approach speed, 175 knots um, as a minimum if we were right low on gas. Sometimes it was faster than that. We had to add five or 10 knots. And we're talking like 350 to 400 kilometers per hour, okay? So we're hustling down here. And so we had to make sure we touched down early on the runway or else we'd run out of runway to get stopped. So they installed styrofoam blocks, big styrofoam blocks that were four feet high, 300 feet short of the runway, and they painted them fluorescent red so that if we got low, those blocks would give us the impression that we were low. They actually called them impression fences. It was like a series of these blocks all along the approach side of the runway. Well, throughout the winter, the snow clearing guys had just been acute, just been blowing snow around these things. So they, there was about six inches of these showing out the top, and they were just surrounded by really packed, blown and plowed snow and ice. And so after my wheels broke out into the open, they then impacted the side of that wall around the impression fences and it just ripped the main landing gears right off, right off the voodoo. So I ended up, you know, I, I felt this thud and I just deployed the drag chute and landed on the runway in the normal attitude which was normally on the main gears with the nose wheel in the air. But when I went to lower the nose wheel, I realized it was already down and I was on the burner cans. So I looked out the side and well, we're too close to the ground here, you know? So <laughs> we rolled out on the runway, right on the center line. To, I got, came to a stop after 7,000 feet. I had no brakes, of course, but the drag chute fortunately deployed and uh, technicians came out and uh, uh, put buckets on the fuel vents because when we shut down the engines, it always vented fuel, and I didn't want to be venting fuel on hot burner cans on the ground. So I waited for them, and uh, once we shut down the engine, we just jumped out of the airplane, and the base commander was kind of there waiting for us. <laughs> now, when we, every time we landed from a trip, we'd be taxiing in, and the navigator would call up the operations, squadron operations, and tell them whether we were green, serviceable for another flight, or red, unserviceable, and for what reason. And I do remember distinctly rolling down the runway and saying to Daryl Marlowe, who was in my back seat, you better call Lark Ops and tell them we're red for landing gear. I was trying to, you know, make, trying to keep my humor up, 
he didn't think that was very funny. <laughs> but as the base commander said, they didn't take it off my mess bill. Uh, I didn't have to pay for the airplane, but that airplane never flew again. Uh, right towards, right at the end, um, in June of 84, so we flew, my last trip was on the 6th of July, uh, 1984, on the Voodoo, uh, but in June, um, a USAF exchange officer arrived um, because he was being posted to Bagotville on the F-18s. He hadn't been on his F-18 course yet, but he was being posted to 425 Squadron as an F-18 pilot when they were standing up 425. And his father had flown the Voodoo in the United States Air Force. And I was given the opportunity to take him flying in um, one of our Voodoos that had two sticks. So it was a duel, so he was able to fly as well. And uh, during that flight, uh, every, every time a guy flew in, in the Voodoo for the first time, uh, or like once only, for whether it was a technician or whoever, we gave them a certificate you know, with the squad and crest on it and all that, that said who they'd flown with on what date and how high and how fast they'd gone. So I thought, okay, let's see how high and how fast we can go. And we uh, got up to 54,300 feet. And when we, I tell people, there's an, there's an old line about flying an airplane and having nothing on the airspeed indicator but the manufacturer's name. And when we went over the top at 54,300, there was nothing on the airspeed indicator. We were ballistic over the top very slow um, and when we came down I just kept it in full afterburner until I was pointed pretty much straight down and we got up to Mach 1.63 which was the fastest I've ever been in any airplane and uh, that was pretty exciting and it took about 10,000 feet to recover from that dive so didn't want to leave it too long <laughs> it was uh, it was a little nerve-wracking I had my eyes glued to the altimeter uh, I was going from the altimeter to the speed to see you know how how we made out uh, the speed also equated to a thousand knots true airspeed, which is very fast. Uh, but I was watching the altitude, and it was 30,000 feet when I initiated the recovery. And I th actually, now that I think about it, it was more like 15,000 feet when we leveled out. So if I'd left it another 5,000 feet or 10,000 feet, we wouldn't have had time. We wouldn't have had room to recover. So I was being, I was very nervous about it, but I was also being very careful. So. And it was pretty exciting, yeah. I was in charge of the training section on the squadron, so I had a number of air weapons controllers uh, that were, you know, that I was, their flight commanders, essentially. And they were the guys who set up the exercises for the controllers to, you know, to keep them on their toes and to keep them sharp. And they had to do it all because I was, I was just in charge of those guys, but I didn't know how to set up a radar exercise, you know. Uh, they did all the, uh, you know, they set up the live exercises where they'd actually get the fighters out, you know, flying against targets and whatnot. And they also set up all the uh, simulated exercises with, you know, where they'd just put a whatever into the computer and generate, a, a, um, you know, a target or something on the radar and the guys would just have to react to it. They didn't know, you know, it was whether it was real or simulated or whatever, you know. And so, yeah, it was... It was really, it was a neat experience. I'm really glad I had an opportunity to do it. From the time I started flying the Voodoo, or, or you know, do, started my pilot training in 1978 to the time I retired in 1998, uh, we saw a lot of organizational changes. We saw aircraft changes. You know, when I started, we were still flying the 104, the Voodoo, and the F-5. And uh, when I left, all we were flying fighter-wise was the F-18, of course, you know. So we went from having an airplane that was designed specifically to be a bomber interceptor, in the, the 101, and uh, another airplane that was designed specifically to be a nuclear strike aircraft, in the 104, and the F-5, which was sort of designed as a almost a throwaway airplane for the Vietnam War type era, um, to having a, like a really, really capable multi-role fighter in the F-18. Um, and so the roles that we were able to take on internationally, uh, you know, 
were way more expanded with the F-18 than they were with our other airplanes. The F-5 was the only airplane that really had like a deployment capability and of course they did fly over to the northern flank. They would refuel across the Atlantic and go to Norway and do exercises over there with the Norwegians as part of our NATO commitment to the northern flank. But with the F-18 we could go and do anything anywhere. Uh, so there was a really big change in our role in our alliances uh, from when I first started to when I retired. And of course, by the time I retired, I had, I had been, it had already been five years since I last flew the F-18 when I retired. And uh, in that time, it had seen a lot of use in the Middle East uh, and in Afghanistan uh, and what have you. Uh, it was starting to go through upgrade changes, including the uh, precision guided munitions capability and the radar upgrades and being able to carry the AMRAAM instead of the AIM-7 and the AIM-9 that I, that I flew it with. Uh, when I flew it, we were still the best weapons platform out there, but that changed during the time I was flying it. You know, they started coming up with the F-16s with the AMRAAM and, and so all of a sudden we didn't have you know, I mean, that's the evolution of fighter airplanes. There's, they're always looking for something better, you know. But uh, so I did, I saw a lot of changes in that respect. F-18, you know, I mean, it was the most capable airplane. Uh, it was a real challenge, you know, to get good at it. Um, but I, I dreamt about flying the Voodoo for years and years and years afterwards, you know. Uh, even when I was flying the F-18, I'd dream of having an opportunity to get in a Voodoo again, and it was just so exciting. And then I'd wake up and be like, ah, oh, another dream, you know. Like, shoot. Um, I loved flying the Voodoo. It was just a blast. It was a really neat airplane. And everybody that I talk to in my work now, that I, you know, and I say I flew the Voodoo, and they go, oh man, like that was the best air show airplane. I loved that airplane when I was a kid. I just couldn't wait to see it, you know, and, and it was. It was just a great airplane. It was a lot of fun to fly. But, but yeah, the F-18 was, was an amazing airplane. It took me probably the better part of two years on squad and to really feel like I knew it and ma had mastered it, you know, whereas the Voodoo didn't take nearly that long. You know, there was just not as much to it, if you know what I mean. So, but I loved them all. I mean, I loved flying the Tudor, I loved the T-Bird, I loved the F-5 too. They were all great. I had a great career. <laughs>